Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be showing you my setup for creating beautiful stylized alien environments with Eevee in Blender 2.8. What I've done here is create a template blend file that gives you complete control over lighting and colour for stylized environment compositions. It allows you to do things such as phasing between day and night with simple changes to light values and shifting the entire colour palette all whilst keeping the contents of the scene well lit. This is achieved through the combination of full full scene lighting along with a simple but highly customizable node graph for the world settings. Having easy control over all aspects of colour and light will let you achieve any mood you can think of, which will make the process of building stylistic scenes much more easier and enjoyable. There are a few reasons why I've put this together. I wanted to do more stylized environment art since that's something I quite enjoy doing, but as well as this I've received a few requests from people looking for help with creating sci-fi environments stylistically reminiscent of No Man's Sky. So what I'm going to do is walk you through all of the features of this blend file and talk about the process. Remember you can download this file for free from the link in the description. We'll start off by taking a look at how the scene is actually laid out, and then we'll move on to the world nodes afterwards. If we disconnect from the regular camera view, you can see that there is an easily identifiable foreground and background to this scene. Of course this scene doesn't have to be composed this way, but the reason it looks like this is because only the content that is going to be seen by the camera is relevant here. In the sky above the environment you can see two sources of light, a sun and an area light. You'll notice that they're both providing light from the same direction, but what is the point of having both of them there? Well they both serve an important purpose. Since we are working with stylization as opposed to realism, we can cheat lighting by using it to provide the surfaces of objects with extra emphasis through the use of vibrant colours. The sunlight is pretty self-explanatory and acts as the main provider of light which the volumetric atmosphere will react to. It's set to a light greenish blue colour, which feels quite familiar for our world. The area light is used to provide the foreground objects with a different and stronger colour that will not affect the background atmosphere. Notice that as I turn the area light on and off, we flood the foreground objects with orange light, but the air of the background will maintain its blue colour provided by the sun. So let's take a look at the effect that changing the values of these lights will have on the scene. If I change the sun colour to a light pink and the area colour to a strong orange, then we've created a new colour variation without changing any essential lighting information. I'll set them back to the default colours now, but what if we want to change it from day to night while still maintaining clear lighting in the foreground? Well we can start with the obvious thing and scrub the strength value of the sunlight down to zero. As we do so, the blend of the colours between the sun and the area lights will shift until only the area light has prominence over the objects. But as you can see, everything is still well lit and vibrant to suit our style. Perhaps it's even a little too bright for our liking due to the presence of ambient world light. Since the sun is not present, if we change the colour of the area light it will have a more significant effect, but if we want to slightly darken the scene to make it more appropriate for night time, then disabling the area light is not the best way to do this, as we will lose important lighting information on the foreground objects. Also notice how removing the area light means that the volumetric atmosphere has no light to react with, which immediately makes the scene look so much more basic. So what we need to do is take a look at the world nodes, and here we will find answers for where the extra ambient light is coming from. In the world nodes you will find our little circuit board of cool effects. I've tried to keep everything appropriately labelled for easy navigation. One of the first things you'll notice are three RGB colour nodes. These are what we will use to control all of the light and colour information for the scene that are not provided by the scene lighting objects. The one labelled ambient light controls the ambient light in the scene and what this will do is fill in the darker areas of the scene with light of the specified colour. You can see this as I adjust the value, and the effect is especially pronounced on the rims of metallic objects, where you can get some cool highlighting effect. You can change the intensity of the ambient light by scrubbing the strength value on the connected background node, so if I wanted to make the scene more appropriate for nighttime, then I would make that something lower. If you hold shift while clicking and dragging, it will change the value at smaller increments to give you finer control. The node labelled world sky colour does exactly what it says and controls the colour of the background sky. What's crucial here is that it does not affect the volume or the surrounding lighting. In more realistic context, the world sky colour and the volume would be connected in some way, but since we're going for semi-cartoon, almost comic book style science fiction, then keeping these elements separate is important for giving us as much creative control as possible. Of course, just like the previous node, you can change the intensity with the connected background node, so for a night scene you would make the value even lower, which would also make the starry sky easier to see. So let's take a look at this effect. The stars on the background are also kept separate in the nodes from the volume and ambient light, so their data does not affect the lighting on the scene. They are created from a simple Voronoi texture along with a colour ramp, connected up to a background node, and by changing the strength on this node we can change the intensity of the stars. 
The stars and sky color are mixed 50-50, so if you want to have a bright sky and bright stars, just increase both of the values to something higher. Now let's take a look at the third RGB node. This is where we set up the volume effect for the atmosphere. The color property is self-explanatory, however I recommend leaving it as white, so that way it allows the scene lighting to mix in the volume correctly. Providing it with a strong alternative color will interfere with it blending with the scene lighting. You can of course change the density value to increase the prominence of the effect. So let's say I wanted to make the scene look more like a sandstorm. I could increase the value, and I could even play the timeline since I've already set up a cloth simulation for this scene. So here we go. In a very short amount of time, we've gone from a vibrant day scene to a nighttime dust storm while keeping the same style and maintaining a good amount of lighting information on the scene. So now that we've got our scene looking like this, you can tell that the area light has even more influence over the scene. So if we go and play around with the color, you can really start to see how much of an effect it has over the mood of the composition. Taking a look at a comparison, you can see that with a few simple value adjustments, we can move between day and night without changing the physical contents of the scene, whilst maintaining creative control over the choice of color every step of the way. I'm going to reset the lighting in this scene to its original state, and then we're going to take a little step away from light and color to talk about the materials used in this scene. There are no external textures being used in any of the materials other than the Curtis Holt logo on the flag. All of the sculpted organic elements are using a variation of the same material, which is only comprised of a few nodes. It's a principled BSDF shader, where the base color is generated from an ambient occlusion and color ramp nodes. The normal data is created from a basic generated noise texture. By using a color ramp with the ambient occlusion node, what we can do is get different color effects not only for the curvature of the objects, but also for the areas where objects are in close proximity to each other. Notice how on the rock we have these layers of color that conform to the curvature of the topology. These layers are defined by the color ramp in the nodes. You can observe that as I change the third handle, the color on one of these rock layers will change. Having layers like this is reminiscent of rocks in real life, but we can use different layers to imply a history. In this case, basic colors work well for the vibrancy of this non-realistic style. A variation of this material is used for the green plant life. As you can see from the nodes, we move from a dirt color to orangey brown and then to green at the very top. The strength of the noise details is controlled by the bump node below. Another useful side effect for using the ambient occlusion node with a color ramp like this is that it will automatically create areas of color variation where objects are near to each other. An example of this is with the rocks on the ground. Notice how there are brighter colors like sand next to the objects, it's almost like they've left an imprint on the ground. If I go into the nodes for the ground material and change the third handle to something a bit more funky, you can see how this is all just a side effect of the process, but at the same time it gives us a lot of stylistic control over the color. There is however an unfortunate downside to exploiting the ambient occlusion node this way, and this is because the node is reliant on camera position data. This means that as we move the camera, we can see how the AO data recalculates. Notice how the color of the ground changes, especially where objects are coming close to overlapping with each other. This unfortunately means that during a rendered animation, if you're using this effect on a large object where many other objects are going to be overlapping with it, then you will see this change happen in real time, and it will look quite strange. So for still images, it's a handy tool for quickly building up layers of color. Over animation, there are some side effects to keep in mind. Ambient occlusion was never really intended to be used like this, but if you're clever with it, then it's got some powerful applications for stylistic rendering. So I think that will wrap it up for this video. Feel free to download the file for free from the link in the description and play around with it for yourself. If you make something cool, don't forget to tag me in your work because I love seeing everything that you've been making. If you've enjoyed this video, you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, and ring the notification bell. Don't forget to follow me on social media to stay up to date on content. You can also join our Discord server to share your work, take part in discussions, and get sneak previews and upcoming content. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.